Each year, millions of dollars are spent on the eradication and control of invasive plant and animal species in California. Pests and diseases such as the glassy wing sharpshooter, the red imported fire ant, and sudden oak death are capturing today's headlines and the interest of University of California scientists. At a recent invasive species symposium held at the University of California Davis campus, scientists shared their latest findings through case studies. In the wake of new regulatory policies, UC scientists discussed new strategies to manage and control invasive species that have already established themselves in the state and ways to prevent the threat of new invaders on the horizon. build on the preceding speakers a little bit and discuss some of the issues that are facing us in managing invasive freshwater species. Um, and I really have um, kind of three um, layers of this discussion. And first is to talk about and to show you the diversity of, of freshwater habitats that we're dealing with these species in. Secondly, talk a little bit about uh, kind of current and future research uh, potential, what, what's being done in the field right now. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, get back to this issue of regulatory realities, as I, as I call them, in the 21st century. They are determining, to a large extent, what we can and cannot do. And uh, as I get into the regulatory discussion, I certainly have other, some other comments to make. Um, and I think, in addition to that, some discussion or comments on education as an important factor in this whole process of prevention. Um, just as a reminder, <clears throat> this is a, a, a graphic from a, from a review uh, quite some years back in which the author was predicting uses of water in the West primarily. And the thing I wanted to point out was that the um, bar graphs on the left show the irrigation uses from 75 to the year 2000. The point I want to make is that that's a very small increase. They certainly haven't increased much beyond that. In fact, there's probably been some reduction. In contrast, other uses of water and demands for water were predicted to go up perhaps 50%. My guess is that's gone up much higher than that. And that would include domestic use. That would also include, if you added it on there, the pressures and increases in use of water for recreational uh, aesthetic purposes and natural land, natural aquatic systems in general. So basically what's happening is that we are, have shifted away from an increase in irrigated agriculture in the western states and the problems that that created with aquatic weeds to a general increase in the demand for and access to aquatic sites by the public. Um, so this may be some review for some of you, but I wanted to point out the, um, the way we classify or, or talk about um, aquatic plants in general. And there are three groups, and, and this is important because they do dictate the locations of these plants, where they grow, and also some constraints on management. And from a regulatory standpoint, they also have constraint there. But these submerged plants are rooted, and here's some typical uh, invasive species that we're dealing with, Hydrilla, Egeria densa, um, Eurasian water milfoil was mentioned in the uh, opening talk, and some of the Potomagetan species, some of which are native and some are not, uh, are typical submerged plants. Floating plants, you may have heard of uh, Salvinia molesta. This is probably ranks as perhaps the number two or three world's worst aquatic plant. It's actually a fern, uh, Pistia stratioides, uh, and then, of course, water hyacinth. This one, most of you are familiar with. And I will get back to the issue of regulation on these plants in, in, toward the end, but uh, just keep in mind that there are three very different kinds of uh, growth habits and habitats where we find these plants. And those have ramifications in terms of dispersal, uh, the uh, ability for the plant to establish and to displace other species, native species, and to impact those habitats. Uh, the third group is, are the emergent plants, and I've also sort of lumped riparian species. And the point is that we're seeing invasive species that are exotic in all three of these categories continuing to come into this country and, to, uh, and expanding in their impact. Most important point to make, though, is that a lot of these, most of these species have quite a bit of their structure above the water line, or in fact, on, in damp soils next to uh, aquatic sites or canals. 
Some examples, for example, <clears throat> on the left are, is a canal that's been drawn down. I wanted to show this because uh, in the western states, this is a very typical uh, winter season appearance of a canal where the water is drained, maintenance is, uh, goes on the canal. It also offers some opportunity for managing the exotic species. On the right would be a mid-season kind of problem with a uh, pondweed, in this case a native pondweed, American pondweed, that's the, the dense growth in the canals. These are very typical kinds of examples when plants are not kept under control in those systems. Um, shifting to the urban environment, and I think it's important to understand that we're having a lot of pressure and the interface with the public and aquatic sites is getting more and more acute. Uh, we certainly have seen that with Clerpa down in, in San Diego with uh, people that live around that lagoon. But here is just a, a lake or a pond right in Davis actually that is a flood detention and control pond and it's uh, being inundated with uh, water primrose. This is uh, going up north, Clear Lake, 44,000 44, acre lake. All these little dots here represent sites for hydrilla eradication by the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And what I want to point out simply is that this kind of diversity of huge lake systems, small ponds, irrigation systems, and including systems like this, which eventually can flow and do flow into the delta, make it a very complex environment to work in. Getting even larger, <clears throat> we're up at uh, Lake Tahoe, and this article came out after some work we had done on identifying the spread of Eurasian water milfoil in this lake. It's been there for some time at the south end of the lake. Here's a little map here. But what's happening is because they're running three harvesters in that system to control the plants down there, they are creating a lot of fragments, and it's spreading around the lake proper. And just to give you some examples of this, and to emphasize that these are all our problems that we've created ourselves. This used to be the lake in the 70s. This used to be an entire uh, marsh at the southern end of the lake. You can see it was beginning to be developed as a marina. And you can tell the water, this may look like you're in shallow water. You're probably out here about 40 or 50 feet at that time. You can see easily down to 120 feet or so in the 1970s in Tahoe. Here's what it looks like today. You can imagine, I don't know if you can see those dark uh, areas back here, but that's all um, plants that are rooted primarily, um, given the time of the season, Eurasian water milfoil or Ceratophyllum demersum. Here is a new site that wasn't there a year before this was, uh, this photo was taken last year uh, in a small marina on the California side, Sunnyside Marina. We're seeing this more and more around the lake. The fragments are spreading and we're getting dispersal uh, throughout the lake. Uh, moving to a larger system further down toward the coast, this is the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. You may know it, uh, this is Frank's tract right in the center. I wanted to point this out because there's a major project underway to control another exotic, Egeria densa, which is a very good look-alike to hydrilla, and a floating plant, water hyacinth, in the delta. The California Department of Boating and Waterways is the primary uh, action agency in this case. And I borrowed some slides from them just to show you what the plants look like now. It's, not, it's fairly well uh, maintained starting this year again. That's water hyacinth. This is a, a mat of uh, Egeria densa just surfacing at the top here in the delta. This is the, there are the sites that were uh, being treated for Egeria densa uh, last year. Not too many, as you can see. Here's Frank's track again. Here are the sites that were being treated last year for water hyacinth control. Quite a bit, over 300 sites or so. Um, I think in, 20, in 2001 they treated about 1,300 acres for water hyacinth and just a, a couple of hundred for Egeria densa. They also have in the past looked for other opportunities to control the plant using mechanical harvesters and the question I'm asking you is a, a very reasonable one. There are some presumptions in the regulatory environment whether it's EPA, Cal, Cal EPA or others that if you don't use chemicals whatever you're doing out there it's got to be okay. Well, we looked at some uh, impacts from harvesting in the Delta. Not sure how this is going to come out. Basically, we looked at the fragment production uh, pre and post harvest, and the red line shows where we were getting fragments at pre. This doesn't show it here, but this, these are increments of 10 centimeter lengths along here. So we're looking at a fraction of the fragment size here. What I want you to notice is that right after harvesting started, we had a huge abundance of fractions in the 10 to 20 centimeter range. These are easily dispersed in the Delta. And so this is the kind of impact you get from a mechanical harvester within three or four hours of that operation. Borrowed this slide from Food and Ag to show you that we have some emergent plants that are new problems in California, relatively new. This is purple loosestrife. Here's a shot of it uh, in, in Delta Waters here. Um, there's a project going on now 
I want to point out that it's spread throughout the delta in very patchy areas, though. It's in the incipient stage. Um, and the next slide shows that, that food and ag is looking very carefully at what, what can be eradicated, what can be contained. These are questions that have to come up when invasive species are first found. Um, I think we made the right choice in Calerpa and went right after it. Uh, winding up down to the coast, and Don Strong's going to talk some more about Spartina, but I just wanted to point out that these aquatic sites uh, range all the way from the, the tiniest of ponds to huge waterways and open bays. What are we doing about this? <clears throat> and this research summary that I've, I've put up here is not ARS necessarily. We're doing some of this work at Davis. But I wanted to give you an example of the breadth of research going on <clears throat> in aquatic plant management. I must say I was a little surprised at, at uh, um, comment about uh, the problem of mixing research and management. It's been going on in USDA for about 40 to 50 years. We have been looking at the biology, phenology, reproductive uh, capacities of these invasive plants uh, for that time, targeting various species as they become more and more of a, of a problem. And you have to integrate that information to a, into a management plan, otherwise you're shooting blind. You don't know what you're doing. But I wanted to list these because these are the more current and perhaps future areas that we're looking into. Um, I should mention all, right off the bat, there has not been a new active ingredient, aquatic herbicide, in over 15 years. And that's because that's a very difficult environment in which to get a registered product to use for controlling plants. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of emphasis, I shouldn't say a lot, but certainly significant in improvement of the placement of these herbicides that we do have, and there aren't very many, use of new formulations, adjuvants, and equipment to get them where we need to get them on the target site. There's a lot of information now coming out and new developments for methods for uh, developing acoustical bathymetry and detection systems. This is really critical. Right now we're having a lot of uh, discussion and looking at ways to detect calerpa in the outer coast. How do you do that? If the water's clear, it's a lot easier, but if it's not, which is often the case, how do you find these plants? Freshwater plants often grow in quite turbid water and they're quite happy with that. So these acoustical systems are, are coming online more and more and they're coupled with G, uh, GPS and GIS systems to give us a much better picture of what's happening. We're also looking at methods using Doppler, uh, rate, uh, Doppler sonar systems to look at water movement and uh, the ability to predict where water is going to move is going to be a critically important factor in submerged plant control, particularly in, in natural systems. So those are coming online. Phenology and identification of susceptible processes. What I mean by that are simply what happens in that plant in the natural environment as it goes through its seasonal responses through reproduction, storage of carbohydrate, uh, allocation of nitrogen, and so on. So these kinds of questions we're asking for the key aquatic plants. This is a new area, rhizosphere ecology, and I'm calling it plant-plant interaction. If you look at the literature, there's not a whole lot of information except for rice, perhaps, and some eelgrasses uh, what, on what's happening below that sediment surface. It's a black box that we know some things that are happening there, but we certainly don't know much about how plants are interacting with each other, and that would be the invasive plant and native plants that might be in, in, that, in that environment. We're looking very carefully at target plant quality for biocontrol agents, and I'm not going to talk a lot about biocontrol uh, this morning. It's uh, certainly one of those most active areas in ARS research. But we're looking more and more as, a, an, as an agency, and others are too, at what dictates the success of a biocontrol agent relative to the quality of that target species that it's supposed to be controlling. Surprisingly, there's been very little work on this in some areas, and yet there, the good examples we have indicate that this is really a critical component of the successful biocontrol program. Uh, where most recently some folks in our lab are looking at uh, 3D, uh, 3D digital scanning systems to develop growth models for uh, riparian plants. This is a, a pretty new area. We're actually looking at some work the Australians have done for a while in this area as well. Second to last, I've mentioned natural products, herbicides. It's very difficult to get these products registered, so we're looking at, at, at products which are actually produced by either plants or some other organism, and they have a much faster track getting through EPA. The best example right now is uh, a product that uh, Dave Spencer and our group's looking at, which is simply vinegar, acetic acid. You'd be surprised at the application this may have in the future. Remember the, the canal that I showed where water was drained down? Well, he's showing that he can control and kill some of the tuber banks in, of hydrilla and pond weeds in those canals by simply drenching them with, with acetic acid at the same level you use on your salad. 
Last one I mentioned is restoration strategies. This one has been sort of ignored. Off and on, there's a, a spurt of interest in it. But more and more, it's becoming an essential component of these management programs in response to controlling invasive species. If you've left a, a vacuum there, you've got to do something about it. And most of the time, if you don't, you basically come back to some other invasive species that then fills that gap. So this is, these are areas which I think we're going to see more and more emphasis uh, with research. But all of those are coupled to management strategies, and they're sort of uh, tied to that very carefully, at least within USDA ARS. Okay, now I want to switch to regulatory problems and, and issues, because this is probably the most important change that has happened in managing aquatic pests uh, probably in the last 50 years, uh, at least in Western states. And um, I want to talk about a couple of different acts that are causing this change to occur and what we're responding to. First of all, you all know about the Endangered Species Act. Section 7 consultation is a process by which Fish and Wildlife Service and the Natural Marine Fisheries Service examines a proposed program by a state or federal agency to see how it may impact listed species. So that's one process that has to go on. By the way, this has gone on in the Delta for both water hyacinth and Aguria densa. Last March, a momentous decision was made by the Ninth Circuit Court, which determined that the use of a labeled legally permitted aquatic pesticide is actually a discharge of a waste. It put the use of aquatic pesticides in the same category almost, essentially, as a power plant discharge, a, a sewage plant discharge waste, uh, or anything else, an industrial processing waste system uh, anywhere in the states that are um, under the purview of the Ninth uh, Circuit Court, which is about eight western states. This is a huge difference in policy and practice in aquatic plant management. And there's California Coastal Commission, and we're concerned about what that uh, does and dictates for us. Um, the, the point of this concern of this decision, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in just a minute, is that it used to be that if you had properly trained aquatic herbicide applicators and you follow the label, you were doing th things according to the law, and hopefully it worked and you got your control that you need. This is not sufficient anymore. What this decision from the court said was that is in, in, following the label alone is not sufficient. You're going to have to get an NPDES permit, which stands for a National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. What that really means is a lot of expensive monitoring is going to go on with these applications now. Um, the other problem we have in, in this is we still have a problem with completely inadequate controls of exotic species transportation. I'm not going to get into that. Other talker, uh, speakers have mentioned pathways. It certainly is true with freshwater organisms. We have a trade out there that is distributing, trading uh, on the internet. Um, it's essentially out of control. We have no training for those folks who are in the aquatic plant trade industry. We have training requirements for those folks of us and others who are applying pesticides of any kind out there. But if you are going to purvey, sail, or somehow trade an exotic invasive species, or any species at all for that matter, you're not required to have training whatsoever or any certification. I think there's a problem there. And the other thing I'd like to mention, I will come back to it briefly, is we have a, a almost total absence of exotic species education that is folded into the ecology programs that are in the K through 12 curriculum. And that's one reason in terms of prevent, prevention that we're going to have some problems down the road if we don't start doing this. This is again that upfront investment that we need. Let's get back to this regulatory issue briefly because it's extremely important. Pesticides are regulated under the Federal Insecticide uh, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA. Clean Water Act dictates discharges into our aquatic systems, our rivers and waterways. The FIFRA actually, up until last year, to last March, pretty much uh, was promulgated through EPA through its labeling process. The label is a legal document. It tells you what you cannot do and what you can do. After uh, March 1, we're now under two kinds of limitations. One is the label through FIFRA, the other is the Clean Water Act and the NPDES uh, permitting program. This was to produce or eliminate pollution in the streams, rivers, lakes, and so on. And primarily it was designed to deal with end of the pipe discharge. Now they're talking about discharges from labeled uses of aquatic pesticides, including um, herbicides and mosquito larvicides. So these were actually could be changed by some state regulations. Every state, not every state, but most states have their own regulatory process. California has the most stringent, perhaps. 
but these NPDES permits are extremely site specific uh, in the past. In other words, for your, for your company, if you're discharging, you have to have a, a specific permit for that discharge. So what happened with this decision <clears throat> on March 12th was all of that changed and uh, the EPA registration is not adequate. You have to have a permit. Herbicides are assumed once they're used to be moving off site as waste. And this distinction between FIFRA, which was label uniformity, and Water Quality Act site specific got blurred and now EPA is, is actually having to scramble to figure out how to handle these two these two acts, uh, which impinge on the, uh, our ability to manage invasive species in aquatic sites. What does that mean? What does all this mean? Well, when you comply with an NPDES permit, it means you have to comply, first of all, with the Clean Water Act, Federal Act. You have to comply with specific monitoring requirements. Uh, a quality assurance project plan must be developed. You have to determine the level of your pollutants, that is, the active ingredients there. You have to determine the levels of pollutants in receiving water. You must determine the impacts of water quality variables once you've made your application. That could be DO, pH, total dissolved salts, temperature, and so on. You, of course, must calibrate your equipment and have instrumentation that's calibrated and documented. You must implement a best management practices program. Your reporting now is monthly and yearly to the water boards. You must keep records at least three years and with backups and you must document and, incre and, and include training for all the monitoring that's going on. What does this mean in terms of most aquatic plant management programs? It will double to triple the cost of those on a per acre basis in the states that are affected. Okay. Section 7, which is the consultation uh, part, which has to do with protecting uh, invasive species uh, and, and protecting habitat of listed species or those species directly, um, is promulgated and uh, controlled by the Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMS. And just as an example, in Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, for the two target species, water hyacinth and nigeria, this process went on for almost two years before it resolved in terms of a final biological opinion by the two agencies permitting the program to go on with, with certain constraints. So these are realities that we're dealing with in terms of controlling invasive species in aquatic habitat, uh, both from the standpoint of using labeled pesticides, but also from the standpoint of doing anything that may interfere with the habitat of listed species. And don't be lulled into thinking that perhaps when you're doing major programs like this, you may be affected. Most recently, there's concern that simply sampling and monitoring for the presence of an invasive species in the Sacramento Delta may require a Section 7 consultation because the very act of removing plants, examining those, may affect the habitat of the species. Now, I'm not making this up. So these can go to quite an extreme and the costs are horrendous. Just to give you some examples of those, in just a minute I'll, I'll put that together for you. These are the impacts we're seeing basically in these programs. Um, Here's the water hyacinth program. For Section 7 alone, it's about $1.2 million a year. This, this is over and above the operational costs. For the NPDES compliance, it's about $3.75 million. So a total of about $5 million a year to comply with those two regulatory statutes. This one, up until March, essentially wasn't there. For Gary Adenza, it's pretty much the same, about a $6 million program. You put the two together and you got about $11 million um, in monitoring and related costs that are directly associated with the ability to manage these two exotic plants and the actions that are being taken. Now couple that with the, the um, discussion I started with which was how you, what are, the, what are the best methods you can use? You start to weigh the benefit of not using anything that has anything to do with a chemical whatsoever and you start looking at the benefit in terms of dollars of mechanical harvesting, for example. And what worries me about this entire process that we're seeing, not that we don't need to protect these listed species, is that there are going to be decisions made not just in the Delta, but by every small uh, localized um, aquatic plant manager who's going to weigh the costs of monitoring under the NPDES program. And by the way, this encompasses all the waters of the U.S. within those states that, that the Ninth District Court has um, control over, but those managers are going to start weighing the cost 
of the monitoring requirements, the training, and everything associated with that versus the cost, initially or higher cost perhaps, of using mechanical approaches. But the what is the long-term cost? And my concern is the long-term cost very well might be further spread of these, of these exotic species. Not being able to incorporate a fully integrated program that perhaps has a little bit of, of mechanical removal, dredging, for example, may have a selective use of, of certain aquatic herbicides, may have some other approaches, including biocontrol. But pretty soon now, these, these kinds of costs for the uh, compliance are going to start driving the programs and driving the decision-making process. And I think we have to be really careful about this. And um, this is a tidal wave that started out in the West Coast with this Ninth Circuit Court. But you can, you can believe that every other state um, uh, east of us is starting to look at this and watching and, and waiting to see what California, Washington, and Oregon, those states are going to do about this. California responded by putting together this general NPDES uh, permitting process. It's a two-year process. It'll be, uh, it'll be reinitiated in two years with another sort of a permit. But basically, if you're an aquatic plant manager, you're, you're going to try to control aquatic plants, whether they're natives causing a problem or an invasive species. If you're working in waters of the US, which is just about anything except a swimming pool, then you're going to have to go through this process of obtaining an NPDES permit, doing the monitoring, and so on. So it's, it's a, a completely different ball game out there than it was uh, a year ago. Okay, I'd like to summarize then um, and note that these interpretations of the uh, Federal Insecticide and Rodenticide Act and the Clean Water Act are going to drive, <clears throat> first of all, more fate and effects research from the ter in terms of those active ingredients that we still have out there to use as tools because the issue of the uh, Clean Water Act and the MPDS permits goes down to what happens to these materials when they're used in the field. It's also going to drive the concern, as I just expressed, about using alternative methods that will escape the scrutiny under current statutes. And what I'm worried about here is two things happening. One is people using alternative methods that ultimately have a detrimental effect. And the second thing is the pressure for, small, for, the, for the groups that are uh, managing small lakes, ponds, or even reclamation districts to ignore that because they simply can't afford to do it and somehow scoot under the, under the uh, scrutiny of these statutes. And one of the, the points I forgot to mention is with the NPDES permitting process now in place, Imagine the workload that's going on at the, at the regional water boards dealing with the, um, the influx of, permit, of, of applications for permits, which includes and must include a full-scale monitoring program for those sites. It's a huge workload that was not there a year and a half ago or a year ago. Second point is that we're going to see an increase in uh, the cost of all aquatic weed management across the board. And, I, and, and this is significant. Because if you start adding up all the costs associated with, with uh, compliance, these numbers get pretty fat, high pretty fast. Typically, you could say before March of last year, um, ranges included $500 to $1,000 an acre as a typical cost for managing an aquatic site. My guess is it's going to go up twice that, if not more, in some sites. And some will be higher than others, depending on what they're trying to do out there. We're going to see an increased need, certainly, for safe and effective biocontrol. So we're going to see more and more, I think, and this is good, it can be good, more and more emphasis on utilizing proper biocontrol approaches that are uh, compatible with the environment where we have good host-specific agents out there that work. Uh, we're also going to see an increased integration of management and environmental monitoring, which is a good thing. This has been kind of hit and miss, and then when there have been problems, people go back sort of after the fact and look at what was happening out there. I think the NPDES issue and the, the endangered species issues are going to force more and more of a full integration of management and environmental monitoring down the road, and those are good things. But I think on the whole, what we're looking at is a very different climate uh, for the wh whether you're working on managing at some low level, some economic level, a uh, an aquatic species that happens to be interfering with what you want to do in that site, or an invasive species that's just coming in, for example. And uh, these issues are, are right in front of us right now in California because of the Ninth Circuit Court decision. And as we move down the road over the next couple of years, I think well, the, the water boards who are uh, now responsible for dealing with this within the state will begin to see what impacts those have. We'll probably see a lot more discussion 
at the administrative level in EPA to figure out how to, to ferret out these, these conflicts between what is a, a legally labeled uh, aquatic pesticide and what do they mean by a discharge of a waste in the aquatic environment. Keep in mind that EPA was caught blindsided by this court decision in the Ninth Circuit Court, and just about everybody was. It's one of those things that, that you simply don't have any way of predicting until it happens. Um, I don't want to go into the history of the lawsuit, but if you can get on their website at the uh, Ninth District Court, you can read all about it and all the details and, and all the, the ramifications of that decision. But I think I'll end here and simply mention that I, I think that in, as we discuss invasive species in general, one of those areas that we um, probably should stop talking to each other about and doing something about is public school education at the K through 12 level. And there are some programs that are been, have been started at that level, but I see this as an investment in prevention down the road and um, as a test to yourself when you go out from the, from the uh, sessions tomorrow and you go home um, and you meet your friends' kids uh, from 12 years old on down, ask them what an invasive species is. And you'll be interested to find out what the answers are. When I've done this, I, there's a quizzical look, and nobody's quite sure what that means. So thanks very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. What I want to talk about is policy in relation to aquatic invasions, especially in California, and mostly on fish. Um, I'll try to provide a short history of fish invasions in California, talk about, then talk about invasion as a process, uh, uh, as several speakers have advocated throughout this whole symposium, and then as I'm talking about process, talk about the positive and negative aspects of policy uh, in relation to the various steps of the invas invasion process. I'm going to try to be a little upbeat. Uh, this has been some thoroughly depressing talks we've been hearing, and I like to think there are some uh, more positive things we can do as well. And I think you'll find much of this, such of my talk will be sort of a retrospective of comments of previous speakers, but with an application to aquatic species and systems. At least that's my hope. Well, in California, we have uh, the usual problems of endangered fishes, aquatic environments, as you heard earlier, are some of the most endangered environments in the world. And over 60% of our native fishes in California are extinct or at risk of extinction. Um, and as the bottom uh, pie chart shows there, one of the associations of this is that nearly half the fish fauna is now made up of alien species. Uh, and this is clearly one of the driving factors. And, and we've had basically the usual one-two punch. The environment changes, invaders move in, and the native species decline. Uh, we have lots of interesting native fishes of varying um, degrees of, of uh, uh, problems. The red-eyed bass, for example, is a species I'm studying right now, which is munching its way through the Cosumnes River system, pretty much wiping out the native fishes in that area. Other species, like the big-scale log perch, have uh, been around for a long time and don't seem to have any major detectable effects, perhaps because they live mainly in environments that no native fishes live in anymore. Uh, the pattern of invasions in California has been pretty steady through the years. Uh, the first invaders really came, fish introductions really came in when the Transcontinental Railroad was completed um, and were pretty much authorized as and, and time went on. And uh, you'll see, see there have been some peaks of introductions. And these are really related to the various attitudes that with people have had and uh, why things were introduced. I think the earliest species were introduced basically because of this, what's been called cultural imperialism. Uh, our fish are better than the fish that are here, therefore we'll bring them with us. Um, that led to, led to introduction of four or five species of, of salmon and trout in a, in, in, bar, in, a, in a state that's rich with them. Uh, the next stage was sort of ecosystem improvement. People thought, well, uh, we've, you know, we're changing the environment and we can make it better by bringing in more exotic species. Uh, that resulted, in, especially in that big peak in the 1960s. And now in the modern era, we're into an era of what I call byproduct introductions, or maybe you can call them careless introductions. These are unauthorized introductions that come in uh, as a result of trade and other things. And I would emphasize that these should never be called accidental introductions. We tend to call them that, but they're not accidental. They're brought in deliberately. Uh, we just don't recognize it as such. 
Um, so, what's the 21st century going to bring? And I think when I talk about aquatic systems, I'm really talking about uh, an analog for uh, all our uh, ecosystems uh, in California. We have two ways I can see us going. One is towards increased biotic homogenization, where everything becomes pretty much the same statewide, and we be what we have in California is pretty much the same as they have in the east or the midwestern United States. That's a somewhat pessimistic point of view. Um, the alternative is to think that we can control this somehow and get more into re uh, resistance and restoration. Uh, and that's indeed the area where, that I'm working in. Well, we've heard these uh, this diagram's been put up by a number of different people over the uh, course of the symposium uh, about the steps to a successful invasion. You, you start with your place of origin, you overcome dispersal barriers, become established, you spread, and then you become integrated uh, into or change the local systems. This is where your, that's where your major impact is. What I want to do then is go through these various stages and talk about, uh, give examples in California of positive and negative things associated with them. Um, first off, and I'm really interested in how do you reduce the impacts of aquatic invaders at these various stages. So first let's look at the dispersal stage where the basic policy uh, involved here is prevention. That's really what you want to do is, is prevent them from arriving here. And one of the, I'll talk briefly about a positive sign which is the Ballast Water Management Act and then the negative sign which is a very poorly educated public on these issues. Uh, one of the stronger acts that's been passed in California in recent years to regulate the invasive species is a state law passed in uh, January 2000 uh, which regulates the, wa the ballast water coming in on ships which as Jim Carlton mentioned is the major source of many aquatic invaders in California both freshwater and marine. Uh, basically vessel specific management uh, water management plans are required uh, best practices are required uh, clean ballast of water exchange um, and uh, there's fees involved and everything else so it's actually a pretty good law it's pretty strict it's actually and we think it's going to make a big difference to new invaders coming in unfortunately there's a big lag time here I'm dealing with a new invader in one of my systems right now that probably came in five or six years ago so but Nevertheless, this is a very good thing. And given California state politics, it's managed by the California State Lands Commission. Um, very interesting agency to do it. Um, but on the, on, the, on the downside, it's really hard to get uh, these kind of reforms across because we need a much better understanding of the economics of alien species. And you'll hear more about this from the next two speakers, but we do need to talk about uh, get the public better informed about the direct and indirect costs of invasions. Uh, for example, the zebra mussel, if it gets into California, will have a major impact on our water projects and uh, uh, cause, cause, cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Uh, we also have to get the public acquainted with externalized costs. And you know, who's going to pay for invasions that are byproducts of trade, um, of which this, uh, the, the beetle we just heard about is just one example. Um, and we also have to even more subtly be aware of the loss of ecosystem services that are uh, caused by many invaders. And what I'll talk about especially is the invasion of the overbite clam into San Francisco Bay that was also mentioned by Jim Carlton briefly. Um, this is an invader that came in in the 1980s and, and it really has changed the San Francisco estuary ecosystem. Um, uh, it's changed it essentially from being a benthic system to uh, from being a, a pelagic driven system to being a, a system where all the energy flows through the benthos or flows through these clams on the bottom. And you can see it's not a very big species, it's you know, smaller than the dime. Uh, and what's happened here is that because half of California's water supplies flows through the upper parts of the estuary, it's been making water projects much more difficult to manage. Uh, and it's been also making ecosystem restoration more difficult. I'll get back to this, but this, the estuary is a major uh, focus of ecosystem restoration projects right now. And this clam is one of the many things that's making it difficult and creating, making it more difficult to recover endangered species. Uh, there, are some, not, there are very real costs associated with this in the uh, hundreds of millions of dollars actually when, you, when, you, when we start thinking about it. Positive side of this has helped lead to the formation of CalFed which is a major uh, interagency uh, effort to do ecosystem restoration. Um, so let's go now go to the next stage of the invasion process, the establishment stage where the basic policy here is eradication. Once the species has arrived, you want to get rid of it. 
uh, as we just heard. Um, on the positive side of this, uh, there are lots of techniques available to do this in aquatic systems, uh, and in fact, there have been quite a few successful eradication programs uh, dealing with, uh, with fishes. On the negative side, as we, uh, we've also heard, there are lots of regulatory hurdles, and they're getting worse all the time. Um, and they're also, it's very high, difficult to change public attitudes, especially towards using toxic materials to get rid of invaders. And this is very well illustrated by the invasion of North, the introduction of Northern Pike illegally into Davis Reservoir um, in 1997. This is a, uh, a, a uh, introduction that made headlines all over the United States. And you can see that uh, the local people did not want the Department of Fish and Game applying rote known and fish, uh, fish poison to the lake. Um, and it resulted in enormous setback for control programs in the state uh, for, uh, for, uh, in general for aquatic systems because of the fear that this engenerated the public largely because of poor public preparation uh, by the department. Because in fact the technique they wanted to, wanted to, wanted to use and they tried in the lake but failed um, was one they had used successfully in another reservoir close by just a few years earlier. So the, the, the need to get the public educated on this, uh, can, these issues cannot be uh, overemphasized. We also, this demonstrates, and when you get into the eradication stage here, of the need for rapid responses to new invasions. Um, eradication is possible only in these very early stages before things have spread. Uh, and as mentioned, it has been successful in the past. And actually, we heard about the Calarpa invasion in Southern California as another example of this, um, where some eradication did, just by a stroke of fortune, uh, seems to have been possible. And in fact, we have a good model in the state uh, and an agency which could actually do this. This is our oil spill prevention and response team, uh, which has lots of money generated by revenue on barrels of oil. And in fact, thanks to this new Ballast Water Act, we actually have money in the state now to use on eradication programs uh, from these fees from ships coming in. Um, and then, but the oil spill prevention and response team um, has responsibility actually for research on ballast water discharge. Uh, they have the expertise because they're used to dashing out to deal with oil spills literally overnight. Um, and so they could easily be uh, trained to send to invasion sites as well. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's clearly the kind of thing we need and it's, um, I think obviously a lot of people are thinking in that direction. Well, at the next stage is the for reducing the impact of alien species is at the stage where the animals uh, start spreading uh, through the landscape. Um, and uh, the basic policy here is really just to stop the spread or to contain it somehow, um, or at least not to continue spreading things. And the positive aspects we're seeing, they're, they're recognizing that, that, the, of the, the, that the importance of, of reducing the spread of organisms can be seen in the long-term changes in, the, the, in, in trout planting policies. But on the, on the opposite side, we are also seeing the live animal trade is growing in the state and creating new problems all the time. Uh, and the trout planting policies are illustrated in part by these photographs here showing you uh, that we made an enormous effort in California in the early um, uh, 20th, late 19th century, early 20th century to make sure every stream in California had trout, national parks, had fish hatcheries, that's, a, that's in Yos the one picture is Yosemite National Park, the rangers planting fish in the high mountain streams, and pack horses going up in the high mountains to plant lakes without fish. And in fact, um, most people don't recognize that some of the most altered ecosystems in California by invasive species are the High Sierras. All those pristine looking lakes that are full of fish were historically fishless. Um, and those that which the fish die out naturally for various reasons are restocked. That lower picture shows you an airplane dumping fish into the lake. That's standard policy in California has been. And only recently has it been realized that these ecosystems are in a state of decline and certain species like the mountain yellow-legged frog are on the verge of being listed because of these, these trout. So finally the Department of Fish and Game is coming around. There's been a moratorium now, at least on aerial planting, and there's talking about efforts to try to even eradicate uh, trout from some of these lakes. A major change in policy um, uh, in the state. So there is some hope then that these things can go on. I hope that well, this moratorium can survive intense pressure from fishermen to uh, keep it going is a good question. Uh, 
unfortunately, we have very inadequate policies when it comes to trade uh, in aquatic organisms. And in my opinion, for example, most use of most live bait should be banned. You can go down to any uh, local uh, uh, angling store in California and buy several species of, of fish that you can use for bait, which are then fishermen typically dump in the water when they're through. You can also get, uh, get marine baits uh, from Vietnam and uh, Eastern California or Eastern United States to use to our fishing for marine fish with all kinds of associated organisms with them. So there's a whole, whole raft of species that are coming in. Uh, in the state and are continually being spread. It's a continuous source of introductions uh, that, that really should not be tolerated in this modern era. They, the picture here is of a red shiner, which is a species um, I can probably say I, I was a strong opponent of their introduction into the state in the 1970s. I said, and now I can tell them, say, yeah, I told you so. I said, because it's currently a major invader in this area. Uh, the aquatic pest and garden, tra garden trade is clearly needs tight regulation, some kind of a whitelist or blacklist uh, situation, at least labeling of which ones are invasive and which ones are not, uh, or, they, or have an aquarium stores have a return tank where if you get tired of your fish, you can take them to that tank. Right now, people get tired of their fish, they throw them in the nearest stream or pond, uh, often with uh, poor consequences. We also need tighter regulation on our aquaculture uh, operations in the state. And, and that has to first start with the state agency hatcheries. Uh, you know, the, the biggest aquaculture operations in California are, in fact, the agencies that run these fish hatcheries. And the other thing that, that a number of people have mentioned that's really that's increasingly important is that the, the web, the World Wide Web, is essentially unregulated. You can order almost any exotic fish or uh, aquatic plant you want through the web uh, and be delivered to your doorstep. But that clearly um, is, is increasingly going to be a major vector for spreading uh, fish where we don't want them and uh, other critters. Uh, the next stage in the invasion process is the integration stage when the species are actually you know, part of the system, so you have to live with them. Uh, and I sort of have three rules here when dealing with these ki kind of systems where we have the invaders that are present. Recognize that we're really managing new ecosystems. That certainly came to mind when hearing about the glassy winged sharpshooter, uh, a species from the eastern United States spreading a California bacteria to plants from Europe and Asia. Uh, clearly, we're getting new ecosystems and new, whole new pathways uh, that we have to recognize and be able to manage and be pretty creative in our management of them. Uh, we also have to be able to restore natural processes to favor natives. This is something I'm especially uh, working on, and I'll be ta talk a little bit about that. Um, and finally, we have to recognize when the invasional meltdown, in Dan Simberlaw's terms, has occurred, so we know when to give up. There are some times we just have to do the bush thing and live with our uh, aliens. Um, for example, this is, this is to restore natural flow regimes is one of the things that I spent a lot of time working on in California because most of our major streams have dams on them. And basically you have a relationship here uh, that's fairly straightforward between the percentage of native fishes and the amount of mouth of the natural flow regime of the river has been altered. Because we have a very distinctive flow regime out here, it's a Mediterranean flow regime, uh, high flows in winter, low flows in summer. Uh, and the more you mimic that regime and, and provide, the, 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 the better off the native fishes are, are going to be. And, and usually in restoration goals, obviously you can't get 100% of the old original flows back, otherwise you have to tear down the dams, and of course you can't do that. Uh, but you can do something in between. And one of the places I, I was successful in doing this was, was as, as a result of a, a trial I was involved in, it was de devising a natural flow regime for Pewter Creek, which is a small stream that flows along the edge of the Davis campus. Uh, and the picture on the left, up, uh, the upper um, right up there, is actually a picture of the creek last spring during uh, the, my official native fish flows coming down the creek. What we, did, what we were able to negotiate from the irrigation district was enough water to keep the creek from drying up, which it had been doing historically uh, as a result of the, of the, of the dam. Uh, we developed spring flows for native fishes, fall attraction flows for salmon, high flows to flush out the alien species because they don't handle the high flows as well as the natives do. And then we, we, uh, we also recommended but did not get high flows for channel processes. But the idea here is, is that you can devise flow regimes that really favor the natives. And in fact, 
The proof of this is in the distribution of fish uh, in the creek right now. The yellow shows you where the, where the natives were in 1991, and they're pretty much confined to about a two kilometer section of stream right below the dam where fortuitously conditions were, were good because of riparian landowners had some water rights, so they kept the stream flowing there. Uh, and the purple shows you what it's like today. Essentially, we have native fishes as the dominant species almost all the way down to the, to the Davis campus now. Of course, I've been accused of doing this because I want to be able to take my students out to see native fish and not have to go too far, which is true, of course. But it's, it's a, uh, a, in a sense, a relatively simple thing to do. The water costs are not that high. And what we're also finding is that it, it improves the native riparian vegetation and we have um, increased uh, success of nesting of native birds as well when you do these kind of things. So there's a nice synergistic effect here. So Pewter Creek has suddenly, be, which had been written off as an agricultural drain, has now suddenly become a refuge for native fishes uh, such as the tule per perch and pike minnow, which is uh, very nice to see. Uh, another example of, of, of restoration and doing things that favor native fishes is another project I'm involved in, studying the Cosumnes River floodplain, um, which is fairly close by here as well. Essentially, uh, this is land owned by the Nature Conservancy and a, and a, and a number of other agencies where uh, they were able to breach a levee and allow the Cosumnes River to flood essentially farmland, which is grows organic rice and still it's very compatible with flooding. Uh, so in the winter you often see a highly flooded area like this. Uh, in the summer it, it looks like that. Uh, and essentially what we found is that the native fishes love those floodplains. As soon as you create the floodplains, the uh, uh, split tail, which is listed as an endangered species, goes out there and spawns. Uh, and we now have pretty much figured out how to manage for split tail. Um, we know ju juvenile salmon love to be on the floodplains. They grow twice as fast if they're on a floodplain than if they're in the, in the main levied river. And essentially what we found is that the native fishes all spawn early in the season or use it early in the season, January, February, March, and April, where the alien fishes tend to come on later uh, as the flooding is diminishing. So you, th this basic idea means that we can actually manage floodplains, uh, especially ones where we can regulate the flow uh, across the floodplain by, d by managing the timing. Um, because we found out that native fishes are really well adapted for use of floodplains, that they love continuous flooding from February to mid-April, but any kind of permanent water favors alien fishes, so you get rid of all the ponds and things in your floodplain habitats, and then you allow the floodplains to drain by May, leaving no standing water, and voila, you have a system that's much richer in native fishes. Uh, so things like this are actually very encouraging. On the other hand, we have to recognize that certain places seem to be lost causes. Uh, Lars Anderson uh, talked to you about all the aquatic weeds uh, in, the, in the delta uh, close by here. And that's one of the things that, that has created some major problems. Maybe there's some hope in the long run. But in the short run, this, this picture sort of breaks my heart. Because what you see here is a remnant habitat of the original, what the original delta looked like. The native trees in the background, uh, native, shr uh, na native shrubs, the tules in the foreground. But when you get into the water, as soon as you stick your head underwater, you're in an, an almost completely alien system. Um, and. Uh, 95% uh, alien species, the plants are not native, even the invertebrates are pretty much not native. So that's a system, probably it's not much worth spending time doing restoration, at least not to favor the aquatic organisms. Um, and indeed, one of the things that's happened as a result of these kind of uh, uh, various uh, efforts I've been talking about and the uh, um, impacts of alien species is that we do have this CalFed ecosystem restoration program going in California, which is spending several, really hundreds of millions of dollars uh, um, each year uh, to try to do ecosystem restoration. And essentially, this map shows you the size of the area that's involved, and it focuses on the estuary, but in fact, it encompasses all of uh, Central California. Um, and the fundamental idea here is try to focus on native species and natural processes and reduce the impacts of invasive species. So all these principles I've been talking about are being applied by CalFed, uh, or attempted to be anyway, in, in various kinds of projects. Um, so it's a very real 
uh, thing to have, and they, 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 I'm on a science board that advises many of these projects, uh, and it's very important to be able to provide suggestions as to what, what's going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, so in conclusion, um, we, uh, when, uh, prevention of aquatic invasions in California is still honored more in the breach than practice, although we're clearly making uh, real progress here, at least in the aquatic areas. Uh, timely eradication of new populations is very difficult under the present system and is getting more difficult and that has to be dealt with. Uh, restoration to discourage aliens is possible. Uh, but there are many systems which I just don't think are restorable, so we have to live with them as sort of alien systems. Uh, and policies are gradually changing, but the global economy is really favors homogenization. Uh, and finally, I think there's a tremendous need for science to address these problems and solutions, and it's really great to see a group of people like this here who are clearly are deeply involved in trying to find solutions. So thank you, and I will uh, take a couple questions if there's time. University of California's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources produced the preceding program. Dedicated to serving people, the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources strives to make life better for Californians in every corner of this fast-growing, ethnically diverse state. No other arm of the University of California reaches out so far to improve the lives of Californians. The division brings together nearly 1,100 research scientists and educators on three UC campuses, nine field stations, and 64 Cooperative Extension County offices statewide to develop and deliver practical solutions for local problems. Their efforts range from technical farm assistance and water conservation research to nutrition education for low-income families and pioneering advances in veterinary medicine. The University of California's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources has a library of easy-to-use, practical, research-based videotapes and publications from UC's farm advisors, specialists, and faculty. Valuable information is available for farmers, ranchers, growers, landscapers, educators, homeowners, families, and individuals interested in agriculture and natural resources. Call 1-800-994-8849 to request a free copy of our catalog or point your browser to anrcatalog.ucdavis.edu for our complete online catalog. There are also dozens of publications available free of charge over the World Wide Web 24 hours a day. At the catalog site, select free publications and you'll see a list of short publications you can download which cover a variety of topics. The information in most titles also applies outside of California and many apply worldwide. You can find out more about UC's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources and the wide variety of work it does at ucanr.org.